a big part of this is about an organization building trustworthiness and trustworthiness is different than trustworthiness is that the organization is worthy of the trust of the people the organization serves and the people who work within the organization that there's trust that, that there's is and we know you can't just say trust me that trust is something that's built over time and so there's a few things that um, we've seen, and I'm going to answer this one a bit more and then pull in Tina and Tracy around some ways that they've seen. One of the big things is consistent messaging, and that really matches action. That if you make a statement and there's no action to back it, that that actually erodes trust. Um, ongoing transparent communications. Tracy, you had brought up some things in our pre-conversations about ongoing transparent communications. Would you like to bring that in? Absolutely. I think one of the things that is where none of that we all have to recognize is that none of us are prepared for some of these difficult conversations. These conversations sometimes are situational. Sometimes they're in response to what we're experiencing socially, and there's a, an, an organizational response that may be necessitated. There may be also something that is happening that the that the, where the employees are demanding a change within the organization. It could be any number of factors, but without the transparency, the continuous dedication to it, right? Because this work really involves not only as and Kim mentioned really being in, in trauma informed, but being dedicated to being trauma informed. And that includes how we communicate and relate to one another within our cultures. And also as I'm thinking about accountability to one another, it's really about dedicating ourselves to a relationship, mm -hmm. a relationship that we have with the people that we serve, not the people we work with who are also the people our organizations serve, but also to look at our employees as whole people, just as we look at our people we serve as whole people. So I like that you bring out this idea of relationship, that this is relational, because I think sometimes these initiatives it's there's the new DEI initiative, <laughs> here's the new um whatever initiative mm -hmm. of, the, of the season um, and that we forget that this is built on a foundation of relational, that the people need to operationalize these, people need to be in contact with one another and people need to be um, like what happens in those moment to moment interactions. So you talk about the dedication and the consistency and some, what I hear, Tracy, what you're saying is some honesty for leadership to say, this is a hard conversation and I might not be prepared and I might need to prepare myself or we might, might need to prepare as an organization to have this conversation. Absolutely. And conversations really stop in the places we feel least comfortable, right? So it's hard to talk about the things when we're just so triggered by them. And so it's important before we even start this work to really think about every part of who you are and what you bring to this, right? The work, because the work will trigger you. It will trigger every part of who you are. It will trigger what you think you know about yourself. And it will trigger the beliefs that maybe you've carried for generations that really show up in the work that you do uh, and in your lives every day. But moving past that discomfort in the is where the challenge lies, but also is where the opportunity lies because that's where the relationship can really come into play to, to be able to practice some humility, but honoring by honoring and centering the truth of other people without denying that we ourselves are impacted as well. Right. I'm gonna let that just sit for a moment because you just really spoke some truth there and just let that sit about how that lands, right? to us as you know what you're calling for is is really a, a deeper level change um i think tina if i could ask you about when you think about the trustworthiness and the need for an organization to build especially leadership to really root um, themselves to stand in a commitment to be trustworthy 
um, something about fostering pathways for all the stakeholders' voices to be heard. Can you think about perhaps something with that, with your organization, about ways that you and teammates have really centered the need for that, that communication, that I'm here and I, I'm listening and I'm, I'm trustworthy with what you're sharing. So about four years ago, um, we really had a, a morale problem. We had a high turnover rate that was like 38, I think 0.9% um, on our great place to work survey where it says management is like, keeps their promises and they do what, it was like a 60 out of a hundred. So we're like, wow, you know, we have a problem. Um, they don't see us as credible. Um, people are saying they feel overwhelmed and stressed out. So we really had to take a step back and be very purposeful and intentional and said, how do we have the staff's voice be heard? How do we create this psychologically safe environment for our staff? And um, we implemented an employee advisory committee um, that they're able, they meet on their own and then they meet with me um, every one to two months or as needed to, to share information and um, make suggestions for improvement. Um, we started something called a staff feedback loop where um, we, every team meets on Monday mornings and the staff are able to ask questions or give feedback to their supervisor who then brings it anonymously to the, to the management meeting as a team um, feedback. We're able to talk about it, see if we can find solutions or um, maybe change a policy or you know, figure out how we can address it, but there's always a response um, to, to that feedback, which then um, goes back to the team. Um, we do a lot of anonymous surveys for staff. We ask some questions. Sometimes they're very simple. What's one thing you want us to keep doing? Something you want us to stop doing? Um, but, um, oh, and then as senior managers, um, we meet with all new employees. We used to meet in person and have um, coffee with them and breakfast. Now we do it virtually and you bring your own coffee, but just to get to know us and say, we have an open door policy. Um, yes, there's a hierarchy and you should always talk to your supervisor, but we respect the power differential. We know that exists. You are not retaliated against. If you have a concern, if you have an idea, if you have something innovative, please, we wanna hear your voice. Um, here's how you reach us, here's who we are, here's what is important to us and what's important to the program, get to know us, you know, here's where our offices are, please, here's our phone numbers, you know, reach out to us, we, we want to hear from you, and we introduce like our employee advisory um, committee to them, and so our scores actually over the last few years are now in the 80s and 90s, in regards to trust and transparency and people feeling like their voice is heard because of some of these um, things that we, we put in place. So what I'm hearing is where one was the recognition that there was a problem and then the serious and concrete dedication to action, setting up an employee advisory group, that idea of them meeting separately Mm -hmm. And then together, anonymous surveys, and it's like multiple pathways of open communication and a consistent that we want to hear from you and that we, there's no retaliation that that so just a lot of really beautiful ways to build trust and, and it took a minute, it, mm -hmm. it's not an overnight thing that that was consistent through multiple pathways and you're able to see the result. Um, I do think some other things that I've seen as well is that that DEI work, um, sometimes I'll see organizations want to do DEI work and then trauma-informed work separately. And I'll say, the thing is when you really understand what a T-ROW approach is, trauma-informed resilience oriented, it includes diversity and equity and inclusion and justice. Um, and so they don't need to be separate or if you're having an org dev, process that's happening separately is so one of the ways to really address this is that your diversity your equity your those um those goals those plans need to be embedded in the strategic plan of the organization 
Absolutely. And when they're right in that Absolutely. way, yes. yeah, Tracy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I hear you. And I think policy, practice, and process, mm-hmm. right? But also keeping in mind that this doesn't have to start in HR. This can start wherever you are. Um, we integrate. We integrated many of the approaches that Tina and her team have. Um, integrated into their organization and in response to some of the trauma that our organization was experiencing from social factors we even stepped into a combating systemic racism committee for our staff to be able to know that they could have a direct say so and how equitably our organization moved forward through that social justice lens so it's really seeking the help when necessary also. Right, beautiful. Um, So I love it's like, um, it's not only creating spaces where people can share their concerns together and separately understanding, because some organizations will be threatened by an affinity group like what's happening in there? What are they saying? And, And I think that can lead to reluctance on the part of, you know, um, of executives or uh, uh, supervisors, anybody in a managerial or executive role to set up these independent spaces because they don't trust, right? You have, there's a a great saying, trust people and they become trustworthy, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, demonstrate trust and they will will show you trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So just as a reminder, for a few people I see ha, um, have joined, just joined us, is that we're talking about some problem statements that we've seen around um, equity and wellness work, um, and then we're discussing some answers. Um, please feel free to pop questions into the Q&A, and we will have a dedicated time at the end to answer those questions. Um, so I'd like to present another problem that we really um, surfaced, which is, as Tina talked about, the train the problem away approach. Can we train the problem away? Tina, can we? Can we train the problem away? <laughs> you know, I want to I want to say as a, a, a testimonial, there's a requirement, right, that um, for us, one of our many of our contracts require that we have two hours of cultural attunement training each year. And I feel like we were able to partner with NCHEM and Loomis Transforms. I mean, you can call it a training, but to me it was really more of, of, I think the training was more on nervous system, how to be aware of how regulated you are, um, you know, really reconnecting to your body. How do I regulate my nervous system or at least be aware of it, right? And like lean into our biology. And then we were able to have these really kind of like almost healing discussions about things that otherwise were like so provocative in regards to racism and anti-racism and to have these discussions in a very diverse group that were so healing and so beautiful. Like people were teary eyed as saying, this is the most healing conversation I've ever had around this topic um, is in this setting. And so even though technically it's a training, it was really a forum for having these type of discussions and really teaching people to be aware of their nervous system. And then we were able to continue to keep this kind of paradigm where we in the middle of meetings where we're talking about difficult topics or things that are going on in the world that are hard, that you know can be traumatizing to people to say, let's do a grounding exercise. Let's check in on our nervous system right now. And then we're gonna talk about this topic and then we're gonna check in again on our nervous system so that people are not feeling as overwhelmed, as traumatized, but feeling like I can talk about this in an open, in in a healing way that brings us together and not feel like I'm scarred from this conversation. So the thing is, is I would say, I mean, it was an honor to do that training with you. And it's one of the, you know, big reasons the way I approach training is that it has to be, when you're talking about um, wanting to do a change of some kind that you've got to bring the body along with because our stress, especially when we're talking about hard conversations around, like, as you said, race, racism, or 
um, other triggering conversations is that we become so stressed, it hijacks our ability for connection and completely obliterates trust. Yeah. However, I wonder that we could have done that training. We planted a seed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and maybe it was a very, it was a high quality seed, but we planted it in soil that you nurtured through culture change. Some of the things that you talked about earlier, the way that you were as um, leadership, mm -hmm. intentionally building trustworthiness and pathways for two-way communication, open communication. Um, the other, the way that you operationalize the training, many times we have a training and then people just forget about it. Like there's no integration. So you integrated and operationalize it. So there's many things that you did that made it more than a training that you really pushed it from a training into a mandate for a culture change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that I mean, a lot of credit to you because it doesn't necessarily show up that way. We can plant seeds and if no one waters them, nothing grows mm -hmm. really. Um, and Tracy, it's like, also, when you think about this idea of um, culture change versus a train the problem away, mm -hmm. you had mentioned this idea of taking uh, responsibility for bias um, in culture change. Could you talk about that? Absolutely. You know, I, running a training center um, makes me accountable to 65 health centers of a variety of sizes. And what I've noticed in my work is that sometimes when we encounter difficulties in our relationships with other people, if we are in a leadership role, it's easy for us to assign a training to try to help people try to see it our way, right? And just hope that they go to the training and have an epiphany about maybe why we were right <laughs> and where they may need to change. But, what that, but doing that is really a penalty you're really penalizing someone instead of building, taking an opportunity to reframe. It is always appropriate to educate, but what happens with education is, is that it can only go so far if you don't create the foundation as Anka mentioned. And part of that is making sure that we don't stand in our own way. So we have to really educate ourselves, as I mentioned earlier about our triggers, educate ourselves about what is our, contrib what is our contribution to the bias. What do we bring to those moments that are most uncomfortable? What, and what can we take, what should we be taking responsibility for? What we should be taking responsibility for is the impact of our words, the impact of our actions and the impact that they make, the impact that they have on the people we serve and collaborate with. Because those are the people that we are in relationship with that create healthy community. And for me, one of the things that I always think is most important is to really think about how I show up first, because I can't set expectations of other people if I don't have them for myself. But I also have to practice self-compassion. And part of that self-compassion is recognizing that I'm not necessarily equipped every time. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. I'm not gonna get it right but I have to be aware to call in, listen to someone else's perspective and really establish how we're going to operationalize moving forward together as a normalized part of our process. Yeah. But I also have a responsibility to take a, a opportunity to know what my pain points are and redirect them so they don't become pain points for other people. Mm. There's a lot of repair. I mean, it's like accountability, acknowledgement, and repair is what I'm hearing and what you're saying. And um, that education is necessary, but it's not sufficient for the kind of transformation that you're talking about on an individual level. Um, and let alone when we look at an organization that's a collection of individuals, that a training model isn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. So like- It's a link. Like, mm -hmm. It's a link in a chain, if you want to think about it that way. It is what are some of the other links? What are yeah. some of the other? Well, some of the other links are actually having a 
honest, as we mentioned earlier, what is your organization's responsibility and commitment, right? Because if you as an individual person have this value and you take this time to build this in yourself, if you're working within an environment that is not open and receptive, then we have challenges such as what Tina mentioned where her team, her, the starting place for her team, right? And so some of the other links look like Let's talk about tech. Let's not only do an a internal check, but I'm going to do an organizational check because guess what? I might not be where I think I am. And other people will tell me that because they experience it very differently than I do. And I have to be open to hearing that. So the organization has to take a role. And how they do that is talking. What do we do? How do we impact other people? What is it that we have gotten that we've gotten right? And where are the opportunities yet to grow? And how do we change the course, right? Education is a part of that because there are things we always have to learn, but it's really embodying the changes you wanna see along a continuous pattern of behaviors and opportunities that interface with other professionals to help you all be better, ultimately. I so we do. You as change. Tina, is there any things that you do around that are in your link or your continuous change here? Well, I was gonna say, I mean, we do do a lot of trainings, but every time we roll out a training, we say, you know, if this is important enough for us to do a training on it. How do we make it systemic? Like, because you can train people, but then it's, I think they said, what, like 2% of training is like, goes into use if you just do the training and, and move on. So it's like, how do we build it into the system? Like, how do we make this part of our culture? And so before we decide to roll out a training, we talk about how is this going to be part of our culture? So to your point for that example, you know, NCHEM and Lumis Transforms comes in, they do this training and we talked about how do we integrate this into our management team? What kind of leadership training? Like, so when you're talking to your staff about a performance issue, are you dysregulated? Are you coming from a position of authority? Or are you coming from a position of support? Because if you're nervous about it, if you're feeling like uptight about it, they're going to feel that. So how do you regulate yourself before you go in? How do you come from a position of support and coaching? And so talking about in all the different you know, areas of our program, how do we integrate this? How do we make it part of our system? And we do, we do a lot of training, but we also do a lot of coaching, a lot of mentoring, a lot of, you know, like, is this, what, what language are we using? Do we need to change the words that we're using, you know, on this form? Um, like we wanted to be more inclusive of, of fathers was one of our initiatives. So it's like, okay, how do we change our language to be more inclusive of dads? Let's look at all our forms. Let's look at how we talk and, and how we, you know, do treatment team reviews and, and build it in, into our system. So I love this, that it's um, really intentional um, planning of trainings, not just slapdash. We have a spend down. Can we get a trainer in here? Um, or we have a um, funding requirement that we need to do a training. It's really recognizing, um, you know, and everybody's just sliding equity into everything they do. So whatever the thing is, it's just like equity. Is there an equity in there? And then equity is written in, but where's the intentionality about the preparation and the follow through that happens. And I hear coaching and mentoring. One thing I'm wondering from a, a T-Row perspective is peer support. And I'm wondering how you, as you're doing culture change work, how are you creating communities of practice among peers, if at all? Is there any of that work that's happening? So peer to peer, so this is staff to staff, leadership to leadership, our staff, our organization has created a culture of staff peer support through through those through various affinity groups. Actually, the systemic racism is just the most recent one. We actually have staff that collaborate on campaigns towards our own organizational wellness. So we have walking clubs that have moved virtually, and we're walking together virtually. We have um, a club that is doing various activities so every month we have like this month we have a pizza party and they send us uh all the topping a pizza of our choosing in a box frozen right for us to bake and eat together just really creating opportunities for people to come together 
in these really informal and formal ways. Um, a formal way we've done it is we've integrated those connections into meetings. We've actually started a system called a Yagadag where we have 10 to 15 minutes of unstructured meeting, of meeting time on our agenda, where we move people into breakout rooms where they can check in with each other about anything except work, right? How are you doing? How are you feeling? I haven't seen you for a year, right? I need to feel a little more connected to you. How can, you know, we, um, we did a Yagadag one time that was about 10 minutes long and someone spent 10 minutes explaining how to break sourdough bread and everybody was so happy. And then we came back together and we talked policies and procedures, it was, <laughs> right? But the meeting felt lighter. People were more engaged, people were more interested. And it was really about the intentionality of taking that unstructured time. We do, and we do it at least twice a month. We're doing something very organized and intentional to draw people together um, and to make sure they're still connected no matter what. And this is the thing, we feel this urgency, right? We know equity, um, of uh, inequity of all kinds, economic, racial inequity, gender-based, there's all kinds of inequities and we feel the urgency of addressing it. And I think sometimes people just want to jump over, okay, what are we doing? This action bias, like, okay, what are we doing? And forgetting that these little things you think it's a pizza party, we're just yakking, but this is where, or yagadagging as you call it, this is where the, where that relational glue that is needed. Mm -hmm. Because once you enter those hard conversations, once you talk about the policy, once you talk about harm and acknowledgement of harm, that relational glue, if it's not strong, it just fractures. And so being intentional about it, you know, leading up and all throughout any initiative is really what's the foundation that makes it successful. So I appreciate like what seems small, again, is those little things over time. I'd like to just address one more problem here. And then we have a couple of questions and they're pretty great questions actually, especially this uh, small organization one is a, is a tough one. Um, and the last problem that I, I, we've hinted at here is this idea where there's a disconnect between how an organization is with their client, participant, patient, student, whatever you want to call, whatever your organization calls, member. Mm -hmm. And there's a disconnect between how the organization is with them versus how they, the organization is with, within their staff to their own staff, where there becomes an over-focus on the participant, the client, the patient, and an under-focus on the staff. Um, and we had a, you know, some pre-conversations and we talked about how this um, is so problematic to um, trust, right? To trust, let alone equity. So um, I think, uh, Tina, you talked a little bit about the need for leadership skills and the growth of leadership skills. Could you address that in this context of how to support staff as much as you support them? Yes. Um, so we looked at it twofold. We looked at it as, um, you know, people leave their job because they don't like their supervisor. That's the number one reason that they leave, not so much because of the pay or, you know, other things. It's like, do I like my supervisor? And, you know, do I feel like there's a purpose behind the work? Um, and then the other thing is we're asking staff to care about the clients and to be kind to them. And so if they're not being kind to one another, why, like, how would I expect them to be kind um, to the families? And so several years ago, um, when we were looking at our turnover rate and those kind of things, we said, you know, we noticed there's gossip. Um, there's people not being kind to one another, people not having an attitude of, of helpfulness. And so we said, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say kindness matters and we are going to talk about kindness. And if we're not gonna be kind to one another, then this is like not the place for you um, to work. We will help you find where you fit somewhere else, but we are going to be kind to one another. 
Um, we started the drop for your bucket. We talked about being a bucket filler or bucket dipper. Um, bucket dippers are gossipers. They, they spread negative information. They encourage complaining instead of being solution focused and encouraging like, go talk to a senior manager. Like you have a valid concern. You should, you know, talk to your supervisor, talk to their supervisor, you know, let's get that solved. Whereas a bucket filler was someone who was kind, who recognized the good in people, um, who gave people the benefit of the doubt and, and gave people grace. And so then we talked about, okay, how do we get our management team to where it needs to be, which is kind, but also supportive and having the appropriate leadership skills about how to support the staff, how to be good leaders. What does that mean to be um, like a good, you know, producers want to be with other producers. So are you willing to roll up your sleeves and, and get in there, you know, with your staff and, and help them out? Um, are you willing to develop people and talk about succession planning and care about them as human beings and whatever that looks like, either with our agency or somewhere else, but just how am I, you know, investing in you as a person, as a human, as a professional to be the best you that, you know, you want to be. And so we did training, you know, obviously is always like our initial jumping point, but then it's like, how do we build it into the culture? Let's continue to have leadership exercises at all of our management meetings so that we're reserving a piece of that where they can learn a different leadership skill or talk about barriers that they're having or things that they want to implement and network um, with one another because we're all over LA County. So bring out all the supervisors together and put them in groups and let them talk about things that are working, struggles, what's working, share creative ideas. So I hear some, a couple of really interesting things because often people are promoted um, into managerial roles without for their excellence in whatever their service provision or whatever they're doing, not necessarily with enough resourcing to be managers That's and right. without the larger container to emphasize cultural values that promote trust and build equity. Um, the, the thing I also want to point that I heard in what you said is about gossip. And I have come to realize that gossip is about power. Mm -hmm. People gossip when they don't feel that they have power, they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. So they will go around the side because they have nowhere to speak. And so for, to say no gossiping, but not give anybody anywhere to share their concerns is not equitable. Instead, you created legitimate pathways without retaliation for people to share concerns and, to, and you were addressing those concerns, hearing them. That probably did as much to eradicate gossip mm -hmm. as saying no gossip and saying kindness cares because you created an alternative culture. Um, and so when I see gossip, gossip is a symptom mm -hmm. as well. And it's side, and you can see people without a lot of power will do it, but sometimes people with power will also use gossip or side conversations to consolidate power instead of being transparent, which is a T row principle. Mm -hmm. And it causes access to power to be a hidden and perpetuates inequity. So the transparency that you have in the T row approach really helps bring the the you know that people's voices and um, concerns can be seen in 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 public. And we talked about their emotional and mental hygiene. You know, we talked about you know we all are getting pretty good about what we put in our bodies, right? But are we talking about what we put in our mind? And we talked about moral elevation, which is like when you see an act of kindness or you see someone doing something nice, you actually have a physical reaction. You produce oxytocin. There's usually a nice warm sensation in your chest. You feel good and you feel like you wanna do something nice for someone else. So how do we elicit that type of good feeling? Because when you do go and gossip, maybe in that moment you feel a little adrenaline rush, but then you leave and your problem didn't get solved. Oops. And it doesn't like it doesn't feel good versus if you go to someone and say, I'm really struggling with this. And that person says, you know, you should go talk to Tina or you should go talk to Patricia or, you know, why don't you, you know, send an email or this is a suggestion for how to get your problem solved. Now I feel better. I feel heard. I feel validated. I had a peer support and I got a way, you know, to hopefully have 
have my problem solved. And that's really an act of kindness because I helped out and supported my peer. And that just feels a lot better than joining in the complaining and really saying it just like that to people like, don't you want to feel good? And we actually showed them a video of all these acts of kindness and said, how do you feel right now? And oh, I feel it in my chest. Guess what? That's what you're supposed to feel. That's like the, the selfish act of kindness, right? The most selfless, selfish <laughs> kindness that it, it, it makes you feel good and doesn't that feel better. And really, you know, going out of our way to tell people this is, it just feels better. So in some ways, some of the things that we've been talking about here are really about, I mean, I th hope that people are starting to see the braiding. This is just good management. This is just running a, a functional organization. A functional organization is an equitable organization. Place where people feel safe and trusting, they team well, they perform well. Um, the, you know, you actually can have pleasure and enjoyment in the work. And so when, you know, you separate out like, oh, we're having a trust initiative or we're having a, uh, you know, this is our equity or our team or our organizational development. When we realize that we can braid these together using the t row approach that is very principle oriented and the fruit of it is in all of these ways where you have this feeling of moral elevation where gossip decreases because people have legitimate pathways for communication to a, you know a leadership that hears them and is responsive as tracy talked about people taking a self-responsibility as well as the organization taking responsibility and doing um of what's hard and preparing for it being intentional about it entering into it and following through I want to make time for some these couple of questions because they're pretty juicy. Um, so let's take this question and uh, throw it out to both of you for answering. Well, maybe we'll give Tracy you, you the first one at this one. So this is how do we get our HR staff and teams to completely reframe how they work to embrace this model? I think as I mentioned earlier, the TIRO, TIRO or TRO doesn't have to start in HR. It's really a philosophy of relationship and you can bring HR along. So as you know more, you do more. One of the things that we've done is recognizing that because this process is very parallel with the organization and the individual person, we have to support people differently in order to, and, and bring our HR along. So what that might mean is maybe our HR is reaching out to people to talk to them about, we're expanding your benefit package for mental health services yeah. because we wanna make sure that you're okay. We wanna check in and make sure that there is something that you have access to that is tangible for your, for your psychological well-being. But also we may send you, um, we may send, you know, we may acknowledge something that you've done that falls within our values and we may send you a DoorDash card because we want you to have a, a free meal and a hot meal or have something for your family. And so it's really pulling people along with you and helping them see it is a part of that, but also on a different perspective, when, when we sought technical assistance, one of the things that we said was, we want to know, we, yes, we're interested in how our members and affiliates feel. We're always concerned about that, but we care first, we're going to start with us. Where do we, where's our place? And so our place includes HR, right? Our place includes the policies that we've written. It includes the people that, that deliver those messages. So they also participate in our trainings as well as participate in our activities because we want to frame, reframe the way maybe we talk about certain things. And we also want to make sure that our policies demonstrate our values, right? So it's really a five-year change, right? A five-year cultural shift, but it's a cultural shift that takes time to stop, evaluate, and reframe all the time. Mm -hmm. I would uh, even add to that is that leadership, you have to have top, top level leadership buy-in. Absolutely. Um, 
having it's our executive scary. director helps. Yes. Yeah, that um, spending a moment and really having um, uh, a time for executives to and top leadership in an organization to do some self-reflection and self-development around the concepts, around, around equity, around DEI work, around TIRA work, and really ideally take an embodied approach. Right now I'm on a project with the LA County Department of Health Services, which is a, like the second largest, it's not a nonprofit, it's a governmental organization, but the second largest health, public health system in the country. And we're starting with executives about really how do we resource them so that they can confidently and calmly talk about these issues and set the tone. Absolutely. You don't stop there, but it needs to be part of it, right? Because often what we see is the work is with line staff or middle managers, and it doesn't, you know, uh, you know, um, upper management is just like too busy or um, so that intern or too concerned with the organization and forgetting about themselves as people holding the space. Oh, the questions are coming in. Okay. So Tiro, yeah, trauma-informed, resilience-oriented trauma-informed, resilience-oriented. And ideally you become a trauma-informed, resilient organization. Mm -hmm. um, and the approach is called resilience-oriented. Um, but I, the outcome is a TIRA organization. Absolutely. So yes. So we have another question. We have a few more questions here. Um, what do you recommend in a very small organization, say five or fewer, where there is limited diversity, i.e. only one staff member is a person of color? What can one do to make sure it is a safe and trustworthy space for these difficult conversations? I think I'm gonna take this one and then the next one, kindness, and we're gonna to give to, to Tina. I would recommend uh, looking at the principle of cultural humility, which is one of the core principles of TRO. Um, and the, the approach of cultural humility, often when we start learning about diversity, equity, inclusion, this type of thing, we learn the idea that focuses on the other, like learn about the other. So if you have a normative identity, if you're cisgendered, if you're um, heterosexual, if you're able-bodied, if you're white, whatever the norm is of the various social identities, then you want to learn about the other person is the focus. And with cultural humility, it actually asks you to start with your own identities. What is whiteness? What is white culture? What is able-bodied culture? What is cis culture? And so being able to start, everybody can do that exploration. And this brings in the second concept of intersectionality, that we hold multiple identities. And on some identities, we may have a position of privilege. And again, that's unearned benefits, that's what privilege is. Or we may have a position of disadvantage. We're disadvantaged for having that identity. And we all have that in, within us. And so starting with that principle um, really is very rich for, um, for that kind of discussion and asking people what they need. Like, you don't have to have it perfect. You're gonna make mistakes. Asking people for what you need, stopping periodically, checking in the process. How is this working for folks? So let's do another question here. I really like what you said about kindness, being encouraging and solution focused. I'm wondering though, especially concerning DEI conversations where there's a lot of pain, hurt and anger, how to create a culture of kindness that does not mute the anger and pain that needs to be heard. You mentioned creating spaces where people can express their concerns, which answers part of the question, but what about healthy outlets for anger and pain? Tina, you want to take that? Um, yeah, I mean, we've definitely, in the discussions that we've had as a group, there, have, there has been a lot of frustration, uh, pain, um, why are we talking about this? What, you know, what is the point of this? Um, we've definitely um, gone through that. And, and I think that that's, that's part of the process. And we've said that ahead of time. Um, this is a painful process. Some of the discussions that we have, in fact, I had someone complain yesterday, our discussions have been like too nice. <laughs> like, <laughs> we need to bring more of that pain in. <laughs> 
Um, but I think that there is space for that. And we acknowledge it. We do our grounding exercises before we have any of the discussions. We do a check-in. We offer um, different kinds of grounding exercises for the things that people feel like works the best for them. We have our discussions and we say, yes, yeah, sometimes it's going to be painful. Sometimes it's, it's going to feel like warm and healing. And sometimes it's not. And that is just part of the process. And if you're not willing to do the hard road, which... I mean, I've cried at work. I've had some pretty painful discussions um, with some of my senior managers. Uh, for example, one of my um, senior managers came forward and said, you know, are people afraid of me because I'm the QA director or are they afraid of me because I'm a black man? And it, and it made me cry because I don't want to think in that way, but it made me cry because it, I could see the pain and I could see that there's a truth in that. And that was, you know, and, and that honestly led us um, to some painful discussions, but also some really beautiful, healing, um, wonderful discussions. So I think it, you just have to create the space um, for all of that to support people, um, to prepare people. That's another thing I've had my manager say, if we're going to have these discussions, I want to know ahead of time, like, don't surprise me. Don't just put it on the agenda. I want to prepare myself. I want to be ready for it. Um, and they've said, we appreciate the grounding um, we've appreciated advance notice um, and we've done it in small groups. We found that it's not great in a huge group, but it's better to put people in smaller groups where they can feel like they can be more vulnerable and more open. Um, those are some of my suggestions. You guys might have other things to add. I mean, what I hear though, is that you're the, as the leader embodying the your ability you've you've done your work and your ability to tolerate hard conversations to allow yourself to be vulnerable and show emotion mm -hmm. to allow yourself to say i don't know we're figuring this out together that you've modeled a lot of the core um pieces that then allow your staff and holds to hold space in that way. Um, like if you, it's often in leadership, the need to be perfect and, in, you know, um, always like the strong one does, isn't necessarily helpful when it comes to, you know, you know, everybody needs to know that someone's driving the ship, right? Like someone's piloting. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have to have the competency, but also the vulnerability to be able to hold these spaces in a tender way. Um, so I think that that this is another plug that leadership, if you don't have those skills, go get coaching, learn those skills, the emotional um, skills to be able to sit with hard things and not jump into action bias, mm -hmm. not jump into too quick of, uh, um, it's not just too quick of solutions, but also just saying like, um, Let's look at the good side, what's positive, like to be able to sit in both. Mm -hmm. yeah. We just were having our discussion actually last night, we're reading the How to Be Anti-Racist book and having our discussions. And we're about two thirds of the way and it's like, well, now what are we gonna do? And I said, no, 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 we're sitting with it. We're not doing anything. Like we are allowing, like I know we get stuff done and we're doers and we're teammates and that's what we do. Like we handle our business, but we are giving ourselves permission to sit with the process, to allow ourselves to grow, grow, grow as individuals, to grow as groups, to have these difficult conversations and to just like, that's it. Like we're just feeding our souls, we're feeding our brains, we're, we're learning new things about each other. And then when, you know, in a few months from now, when we're done with this and we'll say now, where do we go from here? But we don't need to take action right now. Like we're just gonna sit in the muck and it's gonna be okay. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and like we don't have to modeling, take action. <laughs> right? That's the modeling. And so this is it, laying the foundations of trust through the things that we've talked about, a commitment to culture change, consistent transparency, trustworthiness, um, building relational glue through the little things, leadership modeling, hard conversations, uh, uh, the ability to say, I've made a mistake, mm -hmm. allowing, uh, trusting your staff, allowing people to meet in, by peer, in their peer groups, by affinity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that they can have safe, different safe spaces to come together. 
So I see we're out of time and we could go on and on and on. Um, thank you so much, um, Tracy and Tina for your thoughts. And I know we'll just continue this conversation amongst us and we hope that you all, all do as well. Thank you. Wow. Um, thank you all three, Tracy and Kim and Tina. That was powerful. Um, and I just want to say that both the combination of theory and your really um, thoughtful reflection on your experience was just um, really um, kind of just the kind of fruit that we hope gets shared across the Upswell community. And just thanks for your courageous leadership in stepping into this work. Kind of reflective practice, obviously, each of you do while leading um, is just a rare combination. So thank you on behalf of the Upswell community for joining us and sharing your wisdom. Really um, super grateful. Thank you.